So welcome to my presentation about search engine manipulation. Um, during my presentation, I will have a focus on a political view on this topic and not on the marketing view of manipulated users. And during my presentation, it could occur that I used the word Facebook as a synonym to search engine company. And this has two reasons. One reason is our language, because I don't look things up on the internet. I Google something. And the second reason is that Google is so popular. Google has a world, world market share of 90% followed from Yahoo with 5% and Bing with 1.5% and some really small ones. So it's nearly appropriate to talk to, or to say Google when we mean search engine company. So let's start. Um, you know you must be really desperate for an answer when you look at the second Google page. This is true for most of us and has just recently been demonstrated by research. Um, the results of a study showed that rankings of search results um, have a dramatic impact on the user's behavior and attitu attitude towards, towards the topic. And this is why companies spend so much money on SEO, which is short or economy term for um, search engine optimization. And studies using eye tracking technology have shown that people generally scan all the results, but then stay with the first result. And they had a look at around 300 million Google clicks, and they could show that 90% of all the clicks were on the first page. And of this 90%, 30% were on the very first link, a little bit less than 20% on the second link. And then it decreases, and even the lowest link has more than doubled so much clicks as the first one on the second page. So we really just consider to be important what is on Google page one. And the, this, this, phenom this phenomena occur apparently because people rely on Google and trust them that it ranks results high that fits our needs the best. And even though we have no idea how Google actually ranks these links. And this leads to the question how Google can determine the best suiting answer to our question or search. So I will have a little, little look into the search process. Uh, as a first step, the algorithm tries to analyze what are we actually looking for. Um, it tries to exchange some words to find similar answers and question and then it's still not sure what I'm looking for. So it tries to put the possible answers into categories. If I type in, for example, the name of a museum, it checks if it's possible that I'm looking for opening hours or if I just want to see pictures of the new exhibition or if I want to see the opinion of other users. And to make a conclusion what I really want, Google checks back or takes in, into consideration my previous searches, uh, my location, or the way I asked the question. Um, so for example, if I type in, in Google football, it checks if I'm in America or in England, and then gives me the right result. And what I want to note here is um, you can I can turn off the function at Google in my location while I look something up, but the default setting is set on that it uses your location to give you your best always, that it gives you always your best answer. Uh, but let's continue with the search process. Um, Google has a Google index, which, which is quite similar to a book index. The index is filled with all the informa information found on websites that were previously scanned by a crawler algorithm. And this crawler jumps from link to link all through the internet and updates this index with every new web page and every update on websites. So next, Google compares the keywords I typed in to the Google index. And if the algorithm finds an answer to, my, to a possible answer, it checks on the relevance. This means, for example, that it checks that this website that was found on how many other reliable websites this is mentioned. 
and in, at the same time it uses a filter to make sure that there are no results that include violence or pornography or other inappropriate content. Um, so for us, what we can see, we have not much more insight into the searching uh, process, but what we can learn from that is that these algorithms decide on the importance, truths, and danger of the information we see before they show a result. And we must remember that not the algorithms make a decision, because it's just code, but the designers behind them did a decision on what we see and what we don't see. And in my opinion, wherever services like Google are designed, the de developer should be conscious um, of the possible impact he has on the user. So now we're coming to the influence, influencing part. It is already well established that biased media has a, such as newspapers or political polls or television can sway undecided voters. And the newest studies show that whenever the conservative leaning Fox News channel, channel came into a new area or market, uh, the conservative votes increased in this area. And this phenomena was called the Fox News effect. And these researchers could show that the biased context, content by Fox News was able to, or was sufficient to shift more than 10,000 votes in Florida during the 2000 presidential election. And this was enough to flip the swing state Florida in this neat election. However, search engine manipulation is considered to be even more effective. Um, the reason for that is that the, the competition on the search engine market is much lower. So search rankings are controlled in most countries by just one single um, company. And this means if the algorithm that ranked election-related informa information would bias one candidate over another, all the other candidates have no nearly no chance to compensate for this bias. And it would be as if Fox News was the only television network in the whole country. So in general, there are two main strategies to influence voters, and they also apply in search engine manipulation. Uh, one focuses on the already decided voters and the other on the undecided voters. So this is a logo that Google used on its front page in 2005. Uh, I just liked it. And this is a Google start site that was used in autumn 2015 on, in whole Switzerland. Yeah. And there we had the election. It was election autumn. And now we can imagine that this would have been shown, would have been shown just to people who read left wing um, newspapers or have already Googled a left-wing political party. Um, if we just flash this picture to left-wing voters or possible left-wing voters, this could have a high impact on the result in the election. And this exper experiment was already conducted with Facebook. Um, they did a study on that and they voted they flashed vote ads on Facebook on 61 million Facebook profiles uh, to motivate people to go to vote. And it cost 340 people, 340,000 people to vote on that exact day who would not have done so. So they asked afterwards, did you, on which day voted you or did you vote on that day? And they got to this result. So the study was conducted without regard to the political opinion of the users, but it would have been easy for Facebook or Google to predict which user is, this, is already decided to vote on one specific candidate and to manipulate the election in this way. Um, the second strategy is to, inflace, is to influence the undecided voters with a biased search engine result through different marketing strategies such as placement or the different variety of results. 
Research on this topic showed that a biased search engine result can increase votes for a candidate by up to 50% compared to a control group. And in the end of the experiment, the participants were asked if they were, they had, if anything had bothered them during the internet research. And 75% of them did not notice a biased uh, search engine. And the other 25% were more astonishing. Um, they mentioned that something was strange about the results, so they noticed the bias in some way, but they still let themselves influenced by the, this biased set of links, or a lot of them. Um, so one example for biasing the Google image, uh, one example for biasing happened the, during the Bundestagswahl 2017. I think you already mentioned it before. And there it happened that when one Googled a neutral keyword, such as Datum Bundestagswahl, there appeared a lot of pictures that discredited the party CDU and its leader Angela Merkel. And the pictures appeared because they were added to blocks and then these blocks were just packed with a lot of keywords, uh, popular keywords, and this way they managed to appear within the first few results. Another way or another possible way of influencing undecided voters uh, is connected to the bandwagon effect, which means Mitläufer effect. And the bandwagon effect occurs in voting if uh, that or some people vote for those candidates or parties who are likely to succeed. So uh, maybe unconscious, uh, they hope to be on the winner's side. And this means so if Google shows more positive predictions for candidate A, it's more likely that other people get convinced to vote for candidate A, even though they did not notice a biased search result. So, and at this point, I want to change like my terms from uh, influencing to manipulating. Uh, yeah, it was quite actual. Uh, so, I want to refer to the Cambridge Analytica affair around the U.S. election in 2016. Uh, Cambridge Analytica calls itself a data analyzing company, and they paid around one million pounds to get access to 50 million Facebook profiles from the United States. And this included not only profile data, but also its possibility to read some private messages according to the whistleblower Christopher Wiley. And the scandal about this is most about it is that most of the people did not notice in any way that they their profile was scanned because some friends of them or someone in their friend list uh, participated in a psychological chest test and they never and this way the company got access to the friends data and this is why the data packet was so huge and with this huge amount of data they tried to develop an exact pers personality profile of each user with a proposed to manipulate the voters with a marketing strategy perfectly fitted on their pers personality profile. Um, around 200 people work or worked for Cambridge Analytica and these were not only data analyzers but also writers, photographers and video producers and they produced a lot of content and then infused it back into the internet. And this example that happened to Facebook can easily be adapted to Google because Google knows even more than Facebook about its users and their habits and lives. And since Google already pers personalizes the ads I see, why not personalize, personalize it a little bit more, not just based on, my, based on my demographic data and interests, but also on my personality. So, one can come now to the conclusion that search engines are a threat to our dem democracy. Uh, this is just half true because search engines helps on the other help helps no, search engines help on the other side the citizens to find the information they need 
them to know to come to their decision in voting. And with the goal to prevent the previous described scenarios, it's often asked for more search neutrality, uh, which is a new term. And Wikipedia describes search neutrality as it is a principle that search and search engines should have no editorial editorial policies other than that their results be comprehensive, impartial, and based solely on relevance. This means that the engine should just return the most relevant results without manipulating uh, the order of the results or excluding results or adding a certain bias. And the idea of search neutrality gets, I mean, this sounds like a good idea, but it gets more complicated as soon as one thinks about the proposal of a search engine. It has to order the results by rele relevance according to what my wish is. Um, and this always includes a certain filter or opinion of the algorithm, which means if I Google football, I don't want to know about American football, and maybe I'm happy that Google already knows that I'm in Europe and want to know about our football. So there are several pros and cons to search neutrality. Um, those who, advo who advocate for search neutrality argue that there is just relevance, and then I will see the most uh, relevant results in general, not the most relevant results to me, but for everyone. And I hope that the results will have more quality because um, content must have quality to, have to rank high, and now you can pay to have a high rank on Google. Um, still, it will still be a logical man manipulation or a logical uh, order or filter on the results that the search engine would find. So it would, um, it would add a filter, but on transparent criteria, it would still filter out problematic content, and, um, but it would be, would be based on an organized and public and logical algorithm. At least this is the hope that we would get to this point when we have search neutrality. And there is also the hope that people would not live in a filter bubble because with a personalized search engine, it always shows you what fits you in the user's worldview. And this is isolating them from other opinions. And in a neutral search system, it shows you uh, what's re relevant in general for everyone and not on your personal opinion. Um, there are some cons, contrasts. Um, for the first one is that we maybe would not have the perfect match to my wish or what I want to know on the first try. Maybe I would see American football, but then I have to be more concrete in my keyword search. So this would be a contra of search neutrality. Another contra is that one fears that the results would be more stagnant and less dynamic because if a website has uh, relevant content, it would stay quite on a high rank, even though maybe its popularity decreases and it's harder for other good content to get up on a high rank. And it's often asked, or promoters of search neutrality often ask to have an open source um, search engine or one where you can see the algorithm and this is problematic in two ways. Uh, first, it's um, the, the company's private intellectual property. So if they make their algorithms public, it's like everyone could do uh, a search engine. And the second reason is 
that if the company opens the algorithm, it would be much easier for spammers to have insight into the code and develop a better strategy how to rank higher or in the top places. Yes. So now I want nearly I want to come to an end, but I have some things to add. So first of all, I think we should all uh, be more conscious about this topic and maybe reflect on is this really relevant, was, what Google is showing me on the first for five ranks or something. And my personal solution to this th is that I use a search neutral search engine, which is called duckduckgo.com, and they don't profile their users, so the, the results are just ordered by relevance and not on my personal uh, search history or something. So if all of us type in football, we, all of us would see the same result. And there's something more to add. The call for search neutrality goes behind the traditional search engines. For example, sites like Amazon are paid by companies that they rank their products higher, or Facebook um, filters the news feed to conduct social experiments as the one with the vote flash. And yes, and last to say this, I just covered the uh, political biasing and one could do another full another presentation on biasing in the marketing topic. Yes, that's it. I have the links attached in the PDF and now we can come to discussion.